Hello everybody, my name is Mircea Gogoncha and I am here to talk to you about the surprising places in which we make certain choices in music and how sometimes we make those choices without even realizing it. So for most of us, we are taught that learning a new piece on the guitar occurs in stages. First, we look at the pitch and rhythm and we understand the music notation that communicates what notes we should play and for how long. After that, we think of ways to create fingerings for those things that actually function on the guitar. And in the final stage, we add dynamics, phrasing, and all of these other things that make the music beautiful. But the reality of the matter is that oftentimes, by the time we make a fingering, we have actually chosen what the music will sound like at the end. And by choosing one over another, we are embedding certain decisions into the music that we can then fight against, but we can't ever fully, completely limit the effect of. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to demonstrate this. So um, this is something that we tend to be um, confronted with initially when we think of, oh, where can I play a passage of music? When you think of, for example, the beginning of Le Folie d'Espagne by Fernando Sor, uh, you think if you play the first few notes on an open string like this, that's going to sound very different than if you play it on a second string, like this. And the second string is a little more nasal, a little more closed, but also sweeter, softer, more intimate. You can control the sound a little better. So if you want it to project, you can play it on the first string. And if you want it to sound really uh, intimate and beautiful and, and, and round, you can play it on the second string. In fact, you can even combine them. You can start, let's say, on the second string. maybe move to the first string. And you've created a passage of music that increases in volume without you actually having to create that dynamic with your right hand. You can still add dynamics on top of this with your right hand or in any other way, but there is an embedded, embedded dynamic that you have chosen by picking this fingering. And this is something that we are not always conscious of. This is the most basic example, the sort of most straightforward first place where we encounter this effect. But the reality is that any fingering choice we make is also a musical choice. And we tend to think of technique and musicianship as these two different things. But in reality, the, they are one and the same. It's useful sometimes to isolate aspects of technique from aspects of musicianship. But in reality, technique is only a means for us to achieve a certain musical outcome. So let's look at an example where our choice of fingerings affects not only the dynamics that we uh, end up playing with, but also the articulation. Let's take, for example, the second movement from Joaquin Rodrigo's Fantasia para un gentil hombre. Now, you don't need to actually be able to play this piece. It is a difficult concerto for guitar and orchestra, but this passage in particular is very easy. It is a uh, single line. It starts on the basses, and it sounds a little bit like this. Now, we have a lot of places in which we can play this melody. And generally, most of us will tend to not use a lot of open strings here because we want that vibrato feeling that we can achieve by playing this on pressed strings on the sixth and fifth string as we need it. But this is actually only the beginning. Here is what Rodrigo writes. He has a phrase marking, a legato marking over the first few notes like this. All of these notes are supposed to belong to one phrase. But what if we were to play this as two phrases? What if Rodrigo had written two legato markings there? Well, check this out. I'm going to start in the same place here in the fifth fret. And without using a barre, without barring down this finger, I'm going to play this A with the first finger and the next note also with the first finger. And that actually creates a minuscule break, a rest between these two notes. And if I play this passage with this fingering, 
Without making any effort to separate these two subphrases, let's call them, they will be separated. Of course, it's dangerous because we might make a noise as we switch and we should be careful to avoid that. But we've managed to achieve articulation from our left hand fingering. We don't need to ever think of, hey, I have to stop this note in between to not let the two of them uh, ring together, to not uh, let them sound legato. Um, but okay, so so you might say this, this is a great hypothetical example, but that's not what Rodrigo wrote. Rodrigo wrote an entire legato on this, on, on this entire passage. So what are my options there? Well, there's two options that I can think of immediately. The first one is, what if we did use a bar here in the first uh, finger? Now these two notes will be connected. Of course, we have to be careful because these will over ring and we generally don't want that. And we can stop that uh, first note with our right hand thumb if we want it to not over ring. I'm stopping the first note, right? Um, and that, that way we've achieved a very legato sounding passage. Or maybe we want to emphasize that big jump. Suddenly we have a fourth jump, an interval of a fourth between the two, but we don't want to disconnect them like I did in the previous hypothetical example. So we can add a glissando. And with these fingering choices, which one of them I go with will ultimately decide how my music sounds like. Of course, I could play this bar fingering, for example, the, the one I just showed you before this one, and try to create a break here if I wanted to. But that's a lot of work. My right hand has to pick up the slack of what my left hand could have done. And if I want there to be a rest, by picking that fingering that creates that rest in between, I don't have to worry about that. It is embedded into the music. I can accentuate it later if I want to, but it's already there. So even if I'm having a really bad day on stage and I don't, uh, I can't concentrate to make a beautiful articulation and phrasing in this in this passage, uh, it's already embedded in the music. And I'm gonna give one final example to demonstrate this. Uh, those of you that have ever tried to play Bach's first lute suite, the one with the famous bourrée. Uh, if you play the first movement, the prelude, um, you, you'll notice it has a fugue at the end. And this fugue starts with this formula. And so on. And I had a student who came to me uh, practicing this piece and um, he could not create this articulation. Short, short, long, short, short. I tried to teach this to him and he would just not be able to play it like that. And that's normal because some of you might not have ever worked with articulation before. But what I did was I asked him to play the first note with a fourth finger and then the next note also with a fourth finger. And yes, that is more difficult. It is difficult to repeat a finger here. But if you do this, there is always going to be a rest in between those notes. So his fingering here was and suddenly the first two notes were never connected. Try playing around with your own fingerings and try to figure out what are these choices that are embedded in the fingering that you play and can they be improved? All of these influence each other and we should be aware of that as we learn a new piece. That is for me one of the most beautiful aspects of playing the guitar. Hello fellow guitarists, today we're gonna practice a etude by the Spanish composer Fernando Só. In this short etude, Só explores with mastery the tonality of C major in the first position.
Hi everyone, my name is Errol Osever and I teach classical guitar and popular music at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Today we are going to talk about uh, some great left hand warm up exercises to develop not only finger independence but finger interdependence. Now we're going to start by planting all four fingers on the low E string at frets 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, if you have a hard time reaching this, it might be because of your thumb placement. If your thumb is too high up here on the side of the fretboard, you're probably going to have a hard time reaching all four frets like that. But notice what happens if I relax my left shoulder and drop my thumb in the back of the neck. Suddenly I can reach a lot further. So we're going to start with this. Now, we're going to talk about how we transfer weight out of our fingers in order to be able to move in more complex patterns. So I'm going to start by releasing my second finger and walking it over to the A string and back and forth. And then I'm going to release the fourth finger and walk it back and forth from the sixth and the fifth strings, just like so. Now once I do that, I'm going to release the second and the fourth fingers, and I'm thinking of it as releasing rather than lifting my fingers off the string. I'm just transferring the weight out of the fingers and walking them to the fifth string. Now I'm going to release the first and third fingers and walk them over to the fourth string. Now I'm going to repeat the pattern and release the second and fourth fingers and walk them to the third string. And I'm going to repeat the pattern and release the first and third fingers and walk them to the second string. The key here is that you're focusing on being relaxed and you're focusing on accuracy. Don't think that this is a race. This is all about dexterity. It's not about speed. So then once we get to the top of the pattern, we just slide up a fret and begin all over again. That last pattern was mainly focusing on the independence of the third and fourth fingers and the second and third fingers. However, this next pattern that I'm going to show you is going to talk about the interdependence of the third and fourth fingers. These two fingers don't like to move without moving the other, so sometimes we can use that to our advantage to help strengthen our left hand technique. Rather than trying to separate these two stubborn fingers all the time, sometimes we can use the, in the interdependence of the fingers to our advantage. Another thing I often see with beginning students is that uh, they don't like to use their fourth finger or they have a hard time with accuracy. And so this next exercise is going to use your third finger to help reinforce your fourth finger. So we're going to repeat a similar procedure. We're just going to simply release the weight or the pressure out of our third and fourth fingers and gently walk them over to the fifth string. Then we're going to repeat and release the pressure we're not lifting our fingers off the fingerboard, we're just simply transferring the weight out and walking over to the fourth string. And then we release the pressure from the third and fourth fingers and gently walk them to the third string. And then we release the pressure from our first and second and walk them to the second string. And then we release the pressure of our third and fourth fingers and walk them up to the high E string. Now, as you go up the fingerboard, you might have to make micro adjustments. Remember, try to keep your wrist as straight and ergonomic as possible. And then once we get to the top of the pattern, we slide up, release the third and fourth fingers, and gently walk them back over to the third string in a relaxed fashion. Then we're gonna release the first and second fingers, and walk them over to the fourth string, release the third and fourth fingers, walk them over to the fifth string. Release the first and second fingers, walk them to the sixth string. I'm going to show you two more patterns. The next one involves moving the fourth finger separately from the other three. So we're going to start with our fingers in the same position as they were before. And we're going to transfer the weight out of the fourth finger, walk it gently to the fifth string, and then release the pressure of fingers one, two, and three, and walk them over to the fourth string as a group. Then we're going to relax the fourth finger, walk it gently over to the third string, press, release, transfer the weight out of fingers one, two, and three, and walk to the second string. 
release the pressure of the fourth finger and walk it gently up to the high E string. Once we get here, we slide up a fret and come back down by releasing the fourth finger, walking into the third string, releasing fingers one, two, and three, walking them to the fourth string, releasing fourth finger, walking into the fifth string, releasing fingers one, two, and three, walking them to the sixth string and continuing on in that fashion. This last one is my favorite because it works the independence of the second and third fingers while working the interdependence of the third and fourth fingers. So we start in the same position, release fingers one, three, and four, walk them to the fifth string, transfer the weight out of the second finger, walk it to the fourth string, release fingers one, three, and four, walk them to the third string, release the second finger, walk it to the second string, transfer the weight out of fingers one, two, and or I'm sorry, one, three, and four, plant them on the first string, slide up a fret, and come back down. All right, we've gone through a handful of these left hand planting and walking exercises where we practice transferring the weight out of some fingers in order to be able to gain independence and utilize interdependence of the fingers. I hope these exercises are helpful for you guys, and you can easily come up with your own permutations to address your own technical needs. Thanks for watching, and happy practicing.